I would like to welcome you all to our third online meeting. The previous two meetings with Zermit and Shinpen are now available on iversity.org. Today we are very pleased to have Mr. Uri Sik as our guest. Before he became a um, Swiss ambassador to China from 1995 to 1998, he established the first joint venture between Schindler and the Chinese government. And in those 13 years, um, he became acquainted with contemporary Chinese art. As a result of the non-existing network and knowledge about the Chinese art scene, he established the CCAA as a means and tool to get to know more about art in China. In today's webinar, we are happy to welcome participants from China, Switzerland, Germany, Barbados, um, the Russian Federation, and Ecuador. The meeting will run for approximately about 45 minutes, and you will be able to ask questions in writing. In order to do so, please just write your questions in the input field. We now reach chapter five in our course, and in this chapter you will learn more about the CCAA, its history, and the development over the last 15 years. My name is Barbara Roof. I'm an art historian and curator uh, with a Chinese degree, and I'm responsible for the community management as well. So we have um, a lot of pre um, questions prepared. I would say we just gonna start. Um, the first question, which we, some participants asked about the selection process of the jury. Um, could you elaborate about that? Of the jury to be accepted uh, by, in particular, the Chinese public. It needs to have a mix of, and we decided to do half Chinese, half international. Mm -hmm. So that all the knowledge about contemporary art will be at the table. Mm -hmm. And we therefore are looking for important gatekeepers to the Western big events like Documenta, like mm -hmm. Venice. Mm -hmm and from the Chinese side experience curator. Mm -hmm. So um, is there like, how, so how do you select, you just invite curators from China and the West, or um, do they have to apply to be a jury member, or is it just um, coming from previous jury members as well? But we, of course, need, some change. It would not be interesting to always work with the same jury. But we want to bring in new know-how, new knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as a standard a jury member, maybe there two, three times, and then uh, that jury member will be replaced. Okay. So we have yeah. continuous change. Yes. Yes. And with a consultation among previous jury members and myself, we will approach uh, other new jury members to attend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the jury members uh, was Harold Freeman. And uh, François Aquier um, asked about him in particular about his influence. And is he still having an influence um, 10 years after his death on the CCAA? And if so, how? And is there um, a comparable figure like Seman in China nowadays? Uh, Harold Seman uh, was a founding member of the jury. We cannot say that you know, 18 years later, mm -hmm. he still has an impact. Mm -hmm. He was very important at the beginning because well, he added experience and glamour to the jury, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point in time, uh, this was very good to have on board. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, had a major impact in the discussions mm -hmm. because he had, even though being a Western curator, uh, always a deep interest in Chinese contemporary art, mm -hmm. unlike some other jury members who maybe for the first time 
will be exposed mm -hmm. to Chinese Chinese government. Government. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, until his death, uh, some ten years ago, mm -hmm. yeah, he used to be just a citizen mm -hmm. to remember mm -hmm. it there. Mm -hmm. He was yeah. the one we did not exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Understandably. Um, but is there? Could you say that in China you can? Is there a, a similar um, important figure like like Seaman? Would, would that be maybe like P or? Um, we, we don't have a similar figure. If we talk about how Seaman, he is the one who actually invented, created the job of curator. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is the one who, at least for the 20th century, exhibited every single important artist mm -hmm. of, of the world, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, mm -hmm. at least Western world. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nobody in China who would have a comparable uh, experience yeah, as yeah, he yes. had. Uh, but yes, there are, of course, important figures, important and seen from the Chinese public. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them educated in the West and uh, now returning to China for maybe the last six, eight years, uh, writing, teaching. And if we would mention one name, I would probably mention Li Xianting, who is very much associated with, uh, in particular, the 90s and uh, the early 2000s as a curator as somebody who did a lot of research who did critical writing and who also named some of these movements mm -hmm. so that would be like the most if you can say so comparable figure um so what you're saying is that like a lot of chinese uh, curators um are going back to china so i guess this would bring a change to how uh, curators are going to work in China. Do you agree on that? Uh, yes, we have uh, particularly curators who lived either in Paris or then in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them staying away actually for a long time from China. Mm -hmm. They may have in fact missed out on much of the 90s. Most mm -hmm. of them left mm -hmm. like 89, only came back after 2000. Uh, but yeah, they of course uh, learned about Western art in, in the Western environment, and, uh, and 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 thus yeah, play an important role by also bringing say Western techniques of art critique, mm -hmm. art history to China, mm -hmm. and thus bringing some new, new analytical spirit. tools, kind of yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Um, there is one question by um, Carol, and she's asking about, and maybe we kind of uh, can connect that. Um, she's asking about Chinese contemporary artworks or art in Western museums um, like the Tate or the Met, um, if they are going to organize a show. But I don't know, um, maybe you are aware of those um, developments. Um, um, of course, the, the world is big, and there are museums mm -hmm. uh, that do actually have activity mm -hmm. in Chinese contemporary art, but still, it's uh, fairly rare that mm -hmm. the Western institutions would show much of Chinese art. They may include uh, a, a Chinese artist here and there, but, but it's not exclusive Chinese mm -hmm. in that sense. That's not the rule. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, right now, as we speak, uh, I have an exhibition in Bern, mm -hmm. in the Kunstmuseum Bern and the Clay Museum at the same time. Uh, this is, of course, a, a Chinese contemporary uh, art exhibition with some 70 artists, mm -hmm. 150 works, some of them very large. Bern, 10 years earlier, already did a very large Chinese exhibition. Yeah, a very famous one, yeah. yeah. The Met in New York some two years ago, for the first time, did a contemporary Chinese art exhibition mm -hmm. focusing on ink. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, here and there you will find some activity. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there, there is a need for more. Mm -hmm. But uh, one issue, 
has been in the past that these Chinese art exhibitions have been very unwritten in quality mm -hmm. and that could then damage the reputation of Chinese contemporary art for years. Of course, yeah. And uh, I remember such exhibition, for instance, in the Santa Pompidou, mm -hmm. rather weak. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, the French professional people, the curators, museum directors, they think, it's, or they think, assuming that since it's the Pompidou, it must be the best. Exactly. We don't need much more of that. Exactly. So then for yeah. years, you know, yeah. there won't be any yeah. activity for Chinese country yeah. art. So it's not just about the institution, of course. I mean, just because you have a big name like the yeah. Centre Pompidou, it doesn't mean that you're showing um, good art. Um, yeah. So then the damage is bigger than if you would have shown it in a smaller institution. Yeah. More likely. Yeah. Um, one other question was about um, the opening up of uh, the citizenship regarding who can kind of enroll in CCAA. Um, and the question is if, the, uh, if it would risk to um, dilute the cultural Chinese identity into the global culture. Um, because maybe the Chineseness, uh, or what we would call Chineseness, would be lost. Uh, the, the question of Chineseness has been a big issue in the Chinese art community and beyond, but somehow the question has faded a bit. And also in the Chinese contemporary art award, we have more and more questions from uh, greater China. Mm -hmm. It's not open to the whole planet, it's mm -hmm. greater China. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, Taiwan, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, Macau, mm -hmm. in addition to the mm -hmm. mainland. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it makes sense to, de to define the Chinese cultural space yeah. as the space where we would want to mm -hmm. look at art, mm -hmm. not necessarily just the mainland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you feel there is a big difference between um, the greater, if you say, like the, the broader perspective of, of what is Chinese art? Would you say there is a, a lot of difference um, between, let's say, um, art coming from Beijing or uh, from the South? Because um, one um, participant was specifically asking if Art from Beijing or Shanghai is more visible because it comes uh, from one of the big cities, and art from rural areas or maybe from Macau as well um, is not as visible as from the big cities. Uh, of course, there are differences. Mm -hmm. If we look at Greater China, then uh, we have differences in in the art production, in the art making, by very trivial conditions, mm -hmm. such as no big space available in Hong Kong, yeah. space being very expensive. So, of course, the works are much, much smaller mm -hmm. than the works made in mainland, where such constraints did not exist, maybe now to a degree, but in the past didn't really exist. Mm -hmm. Then you have the differences, regional differences, Caused partly by universities, like within China, in Sichuan, the education and the art is very much focused on painting, mm -hmm. while in uh, Hangzhou you had a lot of new media and uh, a lot of artists in new media coming from there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, for very long, the artists once they had accomplished uh, some important steps in the career would, in their majority, tend to go to Beijing. Mm -hmm. So you would find far more artists in Beijing than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So there are you know, many reasons yes. why yeah. the situation is very heterogeneous yes. and may vary from city to city. Yeah. Um, he was asking about how uh, the CCAA, if, um, if the CCAA is aware of that problem, and if so, how the CCAA is tackling that problem 
about this kind of influx into into Beijing, for example, uh, and not leaving out um, the outer areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very aware of this situation, mm -hmm. and we adjusted early on already the process with which we uh, invite or find uh, participants from the CCAA. In the early stage, we actually invited artists to participate, and mm -hmm. that had some consequences in that uh, maybe the most accomplished artist would not want to participate. This you know, is a very specific Chinese issue, maybe, about losing face. You mm -hmm. can't participate but not win if mm -hmm. you have a certain mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. So we changed to another method where uh, we appointed nominators mm -hmm. who would then suggest like 10 artists each. Mm -hmm. And we would choose the nominators in a way that they would cover all regions. There would be somebody from Guangzhou, there would be somebody from Hangzhou, there would be somebody from the north, somebody from Shanghai, from Beijing. Mm -hmm. So we have that complete cover. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting, this, um, this nomination system you have, which I think uh, differs from a lot of other uh, awards that you nominate your artists through nominators and not that the artists um, kind of um, send in their applications themselves. Would you say that uh, that's unique because of the Chinese um, because this is a cultural issue, or um, would you think this is a um, a good tool also for other awards, for example? Um, I would maintain that the majority of uh, awards, which by now exist in China, mm -hmm. but CCA for very long was the only one, they have now also chosen this method. And actually many copy in great detail what we are doing. Can you um, name examples? Or um, just in a sense of... Um, so this is kind of a success model. Um, you establish that it's going to um, be taken over by, by other institutions. It looks that way. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's a compliment. Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah. So it, yeah. it wouldn't worry me. I mean, yeah. Shows it's a successful formula. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to focus a bit more uh, on the new Chinese uh, generation of collectors because um, in the nine, I mean, yeah, in the nineties uh, and eighties, you were kind of the only. It seems like you were the only one collecting collecting Chinese contemporary art. Um, this has changed over the last 10 years immensely. Um, how do you see um, this kind of development and how do you see this changing um, because of the Chinese participants collecting art? But I cannot uh, say I was the only individual collecting Chinese contemporary art. Mm -hmm. There were others, but there were very, very few Chinese individuals mm -hmm. from the mainland. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say in the 90s, you probably could count them on the fingers of your two hands. Mm -hmm. As many reasons, uh, purchasing power wasn't there for very long. The people didn't have any money mm -hmm. to buy. And you look at the Chinese apartment, it's very small, no wall mm -hmm. to you know, bring out something of a certain size, uh, also a, a lack of knowledge amongst the Chinese uh, outside the very limited circle of academy, artists, uh, so the broad public wouldn't take any interest in contemporary art. It also couldn't see contemporary art because there were practically no exhibitions in the public institutions and Exhibitions were in very small spaces, um, underground spaces often were closed after a few hours, after a day, two days. So if you don't know the contemporary art, then how can you take an interest in it? How can you collect it? So that was the main reason why almost nobody collected 
Chinese content we are in the mainland. But it only changed, I would say, after the year 2000. Then more and more uh, collectors came to the scene. First, uh, many people who still had a quite traditional thinking in that they focused on painting, maybe a little bit culture. Although sculpture in the Chinese tradition doesn't have the same status like painting, but photos and new media didn't find any interest. Mm -hmm. So that lasted for a while. And then when after 2000, the, the prices all of a sudden started to rise, mainly due to the demand of Western collectors. Mm -hmm. Then also more and more Chinese stepped in um, with an investment fault in mind. Mm -hmm. That was very much the first generation of Chinese collectors. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it changed. You have now many young people, and they are more sophisticated, more informed, more aggressive also. Um, and you see this crowd, which is growing, growing uh, now also turn to international art. Actually, all of a sudden, they all uh, are very much into buying also Western art, mm -hmm. where they remain, uh, for, for my taste, very conservative. Mm -hmm. they impressionist would, art. Uh, well, well, impressionist is beyond the budget of yeah. younger people. Yeah, the younger people, you know, these are, definitely. These are yeah. like big entrepreneurs yes. who would stick to uh, impressionists and and maybe a Picasso here and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the young people, they buy yeah, these uh, well, trade, trade names, mm -hmm. and uh, they very much follow each other. This is a phenomenon which I cannot understand. If, if I look at the collector community saying, uh, at least in, in Europe, maybe mm -hmm. not so much in the States, then it's very much about maybe presenting your own taste and maybe making taste or maybe um, pioneering in finding new art or um, say be adventurous while I cannot see much of that or almost none of that amongst the even young Chinese collectors. They follow each other, someone buys this, everyone else goes yeah, buys this. Yeah. So it's not like this personal um, kind of individual taste um, collectors might have in the West, or like specifically kind of uh, wanting to be different than anybody else. Um, yeah, the trend so still very much. Uh, they don't want to be like different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is one question um, from the audience. Um, he wants to know how you first in, first uh, personally got into contact with art. Was it um, a special piece? Uh, was it a person? Or was it how how did that happen? Or was it kind of a a growing interest? As a, as a child, I had some art around me, some romantic European realism painting. Mm -hmm. 19th century, but actually I never noticed them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I yeah, finished middle school or started university, to a friend, I became exposed to the contemporary art. And then I had very different feelings, like I could feel some flesh and blood, mm -hmm. pulsing blood there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, yeah, caused me to dig deeper into contemporary art. Mm -hmm. But from a Western, you, you're now talking about Purely Western, um, Western Purely. contemporary Nobody art. Nobody had any clue about Chinese art at the time. And it didn't exist. We talk like uh, late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. There was no contemporary art in China mm -hmm. yet. Yes. So you um, kind of came into contact because you lived there for quite a while and um, how did that happen? I mean, in late 70s, I would assume. Um, you've been there in Beijing, Pushinda, and um, 
how did the first contact, how did you establish the first contact as artists or with art in general? How did you, because I assume there were no rooms or no exhibitions whatsoever um, at that time. There was one exhibition <coughs> in the public space, even the star exhibition, uh, but it was only a very short window of relative freedom mm -hmm. uh, where artists could show in public. But the art at that time, to me, didn't look interesting at all. I was used to look at the forefront mm -hmm. of contemporary art. And, mm -hmm. uh, this was very derivative of Western art. Mm -hmm. and, um, one could speak about the jet lag phenomenon in a way that at that time, the artists were maybe 50 years behind Western development in mm -hmm. what they produced as arts. And of course, by now, this jet lag has faded away. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that was, that was the situation early on. Mm -hmm. and, but then it kind of changed quickly. So you, you kind of got hooked in a way. Uh, otherwise, I guess you, you wouldn't have um, stick to this topic um, the way you did? Well, I looked, as I said, with the Western eye, looking for something very specific, mm -hmm. very contemporary stuff, mm -hmm. and for long I couldn't find it. So, in fact, I didn't collect it. And I only collected in a systematic manner, like in the 90s, when I realized that nobody was collecting even in a remotely systematic way. So mm -hmm. I changed my focus from you know looking for the forefront of Western art mm -hmm. to kind of creating a document to record mm -hmm. the Chinese contemporary art production. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, it wasn't about who can contribute to this global art discourse, you know, at the mm -hmm. forefront, mm -hmm. but it was more about what's important within Chinese contemporary art history. Mm -hmm. And of course this comes with uh, over time because I mean in the beginning you you have to get a feeling for the country to kind of get yeah. to know what, what could be important for this country. Yeah, that was a, an so important a factor process, to, yeah. to get to know China mm -hmm. first. And actually that had been my major motive early on for getting involved in contemporary art, I thought I get uh, another inroad into the Chinese reality then. And the Western, yeah, you know, and this, mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, and this kind of very Western uh, view through the business, I guess. Yeah. Um, there is one question by uh, Na Pao, and she is asking about uh, if. There were sometimes like conflicts um, between um, the jury members and the jurors. Um, I mean, we don't want to pry, but <laughs> could you um, are they that like um, also cultural differences or just aesthetic differences in the discussions, or have we um... uh, all of the above? Okay. Sometimes big, big conflicts, mm -hmm. and uh, it was not easy to reconcile everyone to come to a decision. Mm -hmm. But that may not be just specific to this jury, you may find this mm -hmm. in many juries. Mm -hmm. And the rift wouldn't necessarily be between the Chinese and, and the international mm -hmm. members. Mm -hmm. It could actually go, you know, cut through all of these. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, sometimes we had uh, big fights, but what I myself found so interesting in, in, in my experience in these many jury meetings was that you know we could have very important Western curators, Carl Zenon, other people, same format, mm -hmm. and one curator would say, you know, this is the greatest piece uh, I have seen for years, while the other Western curator would mm -hmm. say, this is the worst artist mm -hmm. I've come across mm -hmm. with these words. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you could see how even amongst the highest ranking professionals, Perception. opinions really yeah. differ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you always kind of resolve it or is it, I mean, you really discuss about it and everybody has to, to make their point or how can we um, imagine 
those kind of discussions and or do you vote in the end? Um, uh, do do yes, in the end we most of the time must do a vote because okay. yeah. uh, it may not be a unanimous choice. Yeah. And uh, particularly Chinese members of the jury, prominent Chinese members, they told us to the jury, you know, and at the end of the process everyone maybe comments on this process. They have never had a similar discussion in China. Because in China, you know, in the art world, it's not yet a habit to be totally open mm -hmm. in a discussion. Mm -hmm. Because you know, this may turn against you some and later it may be an issue when other people may hear it, etc. etc. So um, I feel we have a very open discourse. And for the Chinese, many Chinese, it's very unusual to have mm -hmm. this type of discourse, but mm -hmm. they adapt very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They so see the merits of, yeah. of, I mean, there is in the end no other way yeah. to come to a conclusion. Uh, I have been in like juries, an important uh, award in a museum in Beijing, even where. We were a jury, and actually, a colleague of mine was Ho Han Ru, who is mm -hmm. a major international curator, but coming from China. And we were really shaking our heads. We were sitting there. We were given a choice of 20 artists. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we were, made, I don't know, we were made to walk to an exhibition mm -hmm. where 10 of the 20 artists we should have chosen from were exhibited and they were not. Okay. You know, so basically, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, yeah. the jury you know, couldn't choose one of these other ten. Yeah, yeah, because and, you couldn't see it in the first place. Uh, yeah. Well, because it was already decided. Yeah. yeah so yeah, sure. we must give our name you know, to a yeah. jury activity which doesn't really uh, deserve the name. Yeah, a say. So yeah. that uh, yeah, also happens. And, okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, coming back maybe uh, shortly to those new collectors in China, especially the Chinese collectors. Um, I feel that with the, the, those new Chinese collectors, um, a lot of museums are starting uh, to pop up. Um, how would you kind of differentiate VM Plus um, compared to mainland, mainland China's new museums? Um, in that regard. If we look at the mainland museums, we speak about contemporary art, then as a public institution, we only have one new institution popping up, the power station of art in Shanghai. It's the only public museum for contemporary art. But we have a lot of private museums and they are driven by collectors. Mm -hmm. and some with a lot of resources, very large. And uh, they sort of have to build you know, their organizations. They are doing this while we speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I'm a fan of the public museum, because in the private museum, you'll be hostage to the taste. To the taste of the yeah, right. yeah. Uh, of course, I'm also a collector, and one may argue you know, that my collection, yeah. Yeah, according to my own taste, but I bring it to a public institution where yeah. it can be balanced out with other things, where other people will have a say, where it will be developed, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the public museum is, is the memory really in the future, public memory. But uh, of course, if we look at the US, for instance, many museums started to uh, come into the world yeah. as, as private. Yeah. And maybe, you know, this is the way to do it in China for some of these private collectors. Mm -hmm. But, um, you yeah, know, we don't know yet. It's mm -hmm. too early to mm -hmm. have a so, yeah. Can they actually stay the pace also financially? Mm -hmm. Some most likely won't. We have already seen some people 
So it's disappearing, it could be bankruptcy, it could be other interests. Um, so hard to assess, you know. Yeah. So but time it, will but tell. it's a very yeah. strong trend uh, that very rich individuals open their museums. Yeah. Well, this but that, yeah. A, a, a major issue is that you don't have the staff to run a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, curators, yes, but you yeah. don't have. You don't have uh, the how to say the like the restorators, uh, yes. the art handlers, yeah. and all this. They simply the don't exist. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they don't yeah. exist yet. Yeah. So, in order to have a very successful museum scene, you have to bring up a whole infrastructure mm -hmm. which does mm -hmm. not exist mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. But you asked me like how to compare it to the N Plus Museum. Mm -hmm. The N Plus Museum has this ambition to be you know best in class mm -hmm. and they hired the most professional people from all over the world mm -hmm. with that ambition you know to put an exemplary museum there with all its facets and, and processes etc etc and they started of course also with uh, designing and now building a first class museum mm -hmm building and uh, so I, I see all the ingredients for a world-class institution in Hong Kong. We, uh, yeah, we're going to see, um, or I'm, I'm really uh, excited about this, this new institution, how it, it's going to work out. Um, there is one question by um, Renato and before you said um, for you, Chinese contemporary art was kind of uh, a new way or to get into Chinese society or the culture. So it was like a gateway for you. Um, and he's asking, do you think that this kind of formula is um, could be a global one or is it was it just the right one for China? I guess it could be a global one, but in many instances or in many geographies it would be kind of redundant to try to do that for us mm -hmm. because we have grown up with this type of art uh, for long mm -hmm. and we have free media we travel we know our own countries we know the west mm -hmm. very often mm -hmm. so there may not be a similar interest for uh, exhibition that just you know sort of depict an image of a nation mm -hmm. uh, which has many other ways to communicate. In China, this is not the same. Uh, the media are not giving a full picture. And there is, of course, a lack of knowledge outside China about China. So a broad exhibition about China uh, of contemporary art is maybe the best way to get acquainted with, with the country. Um, there are debates whether contemporary art really, you know, reflects a country uh, in a proper way. Maybe not in the most positive way. This is an issue with official China. That's why they don't propagate the contemporary art or only parts of it, because the contemporary art does not represent the country the way they would like it to be represented. And when I, I see, for instance, this exhibition in Bern now and the people, uh, already like more than 60,000 in, in half time there and how excited they are and they are excited because they feel wow we see a lot about China which we don't know about mm -hmm. so it, it's like relatively unknown territory I think uh, such an exhibition mm -hmm. does a real service yeah there's a merit um, about that, there is uh, one question from uh, Francois, and he's exactly asking about how, um, for example, uh, exhibits in Bern, um, kind of sensitive exhibits, um, would it be possible to show them also uh, at the M Plus in Hong Kong, or um, would that be a problem and they're just going to be in the storage forever? Um, well, this question is also something that concerns me mm -hmm. but uh, the feedback uh, i have received so far uh, does not indicate that you know it will 
Mm. Uh, like that. Mm -hmm. We had now uh, the first exhibition and Fossi collection in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was a debate, you know, could it be shown? Could it be shown in the same form as it was shown in Manchester or in Sweden? And uh, in the end, after debate, one must admit, uh, it could be shown. And also these critical works, uh, they were all there. So nothing had to be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And the government, I think, just in time realized uh, that this is a, an important signal beyond just an art mm -hmm. exhibition, mm -hmm. beyond the art world, that you know, freedom of speech uh, still exists. Mm -hmm. And let's hope it remains that way. Mm -hmm. let's, let's hope that very much. Yeah, indeed. Um, so apart from, um, I guess, the state censorship, um, is there maybe also kind of like a, a self-censorship um, among Chinese artists? Um, the feeling that they, they kind of self-censor their work in a way in order to be able to show their work? Uh, that, of course, exists in every country that knows mm -hmm. censorship, uh, but it exists in various degrees. Some artists will just you know, go the easy route and uh, will consider all the constraints and will um, avoid any issue, and others will maybe find ways to subvert censorship and to play with it, go around it, but not overtly mm -hmm. fight, mm -hmm. you know, the authorities. But then you always have a few, you know, who just simply don't care mm -hmm. uh, at their risk. And this risk may not be calculable and it may be very costly. So you have these different behaviors in, in each country with uh, censorship. Mm -hmm. So, but then let's hope that um, the M plus in the museum is not um, diverted to censorship. Um, I think we're almost done with our time. Um, I guess if there is any last questions coming in, I otherwise. Uh, so there's one from Carol, yes. a young Western art collector finds Chinese contemporary art is very exciting, which is mentioned also in Brazil, India, and other emerging powers. Um, artists have so much to say and say in a new way and with great craft, craft skills. Any advice for young art collectors to also look at other countries than China to compare how the contemporary art scene develops in Brazil or in India? Uh, I, <clears throat> I try to be informed about uh, the global art production, but of course there are limitations to what one can do. I cannot be expert on uh, each and every country. I have looked into Indian art, but I'm not knowledgeable about Brazilian art. I'm not knowledgeable about Latin American art. And uh, the Indian art scene, um, just to briefly comment on that, doesn't have the wit and the depth as the Chinese has, if we compare it to China. If we look at it on its own merit, of course, it's an interesting scene, and by difference to China, you don't have this rupture, uh, which the communist revolution, cultural revolution, represented in the Chinese art production. In India, you have, say, a continuous mm -hmm. art production that leads to very different results. So, you know, each country one would have to really <laughs> look at in detail, comment in detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no overall kind of uh, rule. Um, yeah, of course. Um, I guess this is about it. Um, I thank you very much, Mr. Singh, for this uh, very insightful uh, webinar. I thank um, I thank you to all the participants participants with their questions. Um, thank you, and of course, uh, thank you to the whole team, to Elisabeth Danusa. Julie Hood, Renate Soltenhoff, and of course, uh, Michelle Schindler. Our next online meeting will be with Kathleen Müller. She is the curator 
of the Chinese Whispers exhibition in Bern. And she will be online on Sunday 22nd at uh, 5.30 Central European Summer Time. And our final online meeting will be um, with Michael Zinko on Sunday um, 29th at 1 o'clock Central European Summer Time. I thank you all and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you and goodbye.